What really happened to George and Willie Muse, two albino African-American brothers who were kidnapped and shown as circus sideshow freaks in the Jim Crow South? Author Beth Macy will be here to talk about her new book, True Vine. Willie Muse himself said that he was, he used the word stolen. He was stolen. He named the person who stole him. And that's the story that the family still sticks by. What could be more fun than a collaboration between the great writer Calvin Trillin and the amazing writer and illustrator Roz Chast? They'll be here to talk with our children's book editor, Maria Russo, about their latest collaboration. Oh, this is such a silly rule that people must wear pants to school. A better rule, a wise man said is wear your underpants instead. Is having a child the last stop on the madcap train that is the Bridget Jones series? Molly Young, our reviewer, is here to talk about Helen Fielding's latest novel, Bridget Jones's Baby. I just imagine readers cringing every 40 or 50 pages and and just getting a case of the willies when they remember that this is supposed to be a a letter to the, the baby in utero. Also, literary news and what we and other people are reading this week. This is Inside the New York Times Book Review. I'm Pamela Paul. Beth Macy will join us now to talk about her new book, True Vine, Two Brothers, A Kidnapping, and a Mother's Quest, a true story of the Jim Crow South. Beth, thank you for being here. Thanks for having me, Pamela. So this is the story, in large part, of Willie and George Muse. Who were they? They were albino African-American brothers born around the turn of the last century. Um, They were a sharecropping family. They, Like most kids in sharecropping families, they worked daylight to dark, which was called can see to can't see, or can to can't for short. Um, Their mother also worked, and uh, they were from a very struggling sharecropping area of Southern Virginia. From the town of True Vine. Yeah, it's not really a town. It's like a little unincorporated community. The only thing that's really there now is a very vibrant church. It's mostly tobacco fields. There's a school that became a factory when, and then when globalization hit, it closed, and now it's just boarded up, and um, it's mostly just farms. And it's right outside Roanoke? It's about an hour south. How did you come to this story? So when I first moved to Roanoke in 1989 to write feature articles for the Roanoke Times, um, I was pretty young. And I was riding around with a photographer one day. And, you know, the photographers always have better stories than the reporters because they they, they get around. And this photographer said, told me about the story of these two brothers who had been kidnapped and sold to the circus. And that was as much as he knew. And he had grown up hearing hearing the story. They were not twins, right? They're not twins. Okay. So... He had grown up hearing the story. He was a white Roanoker, and um, he said, it's the best story in town, but nobody's been able to get it. And that sort of piqued my interest in perhaps a little bit of competition. The reason nobody's been able to get it is because the brother's great niece, Nancy Saunders, who runs a little soul food restaurant called The Goody Shop, she's very protective about it. They had retired to Roanoke in the early 60s. George died in 1972. Willie ended up living until 2001. And so the first time I saunter into this amazing restaurant, just sort of thinking she's going to fall down and give me the story, she points <laughs> to a different. sign on the wall. <laughs> yeah, yeah. She's like, he's resting. He's retiring. He's retired. He's been exploited and mocked his whole life. What year did you approach her? About 1991. Okay. So he was still, he lived to the age of 108? Yes, yes. Yeah, he was still alive. And, um, And so when I asked to do it, she pointed to a sign that a customer had given her uh, stenciled on the wall. And the sign said, sit down and shut up. (laughs) <laughs> wow. And she sort of meant it but in sort of a funny way, but she was real serious about, like, you're never going to interview him. Um, eventually, she let me write a piece about her restaurant, just like a, a Wednesday food feature. Mm-hmm. That was around 92, I think. Mm-hmm. She said, she told me when he passed away, she would let us do the story. I said, well, what about if I interview him and just hold it? And she said, uh, I just don't trust you. You're too curious. And I said, well, if I tell you, I won't do it. I won't do it. She said, well... Maybe your editor will make you do it. I mean, she just, she didn't have any trust in the media institution. Mm -hmm. And that was one of the things I began to understand as I did the research for this and saw the way the media had treated them at at every point. And not just the Roanoke Times, but the New York Times, the New Yorker, papers all over the country had covered the story. So you've been working on this story in a way for 25 years. There's almost no time in my reporting career that I haven't been at least thinking about it, mm-hmm. you know, kind of on the back burner. A co-writer and I co-wrote a piece in 2001 right after he died. 
And, um, and was that a kind of obituary or a profile? It was kind of a serial narrative. Mm-hmm. I mean, we spent a long time on it, about six weeks. And we went to Florida. I mean, we sort of traced some of their steps. And we found some court documents. We found out what about the pinnacle moment in 1927 when she finally found them after they'd been missing for 13 years. And she got Harriet, them their mother. Yeah, Harriet Muse, an illiterate maid. And she confronted the circus. And there was this sort of melee. Eight police officers came. The ringling lawyers were there, and she convinced um, the law enforcement, the top law enforcement officer was the founder of the local KKK, which was the largest Hmm. in Virginia at the time. Somehow, I wish it could have been a fly on the wall, but somehow she convinced them to let her bring them home. No eyewitness reports of that moment? A few, a few. There was um, an elderly man who was 10 years old when it happened and he had he wasn't actually an eyewitness there there were media reports but mm-hmm. they were very much cast in the very racist um way of that day they never talked to her but they quoted her in dialect and mm-hmm. um they never so the next thing she did was two days later she files a lawsuit against the greatest show on earth and she wins a pretty hefty settlement even when that happened, she was sort of made fun of. Let's scroll back to the beginning of their story. Um, when were they born and when and how were they kidnapped? So they were born sometime in the 1890s. And that's the hard thing about African-American families. The the records were poorly kept. The literacy, I, I think, meant that when the census takers did, did record them, their mm-hmm. names weren't spelled correctly. And so I never, their ages are all over the place in the documentation. The family story and the story that most black Roanokers over the age of 60 would have grown up with is that they were kidnapped from a tobacco field in Truvine, Virginia, around 1899 at the ages of six and nine. Mm-hmm. Now, as I was doing my research, there was some evidence that suggests that uh, perhaps she initially let them go with one carnival operator around 1914. Harriet perhaps let them go. That evidence is, there is some documentation, but again, it's... It's sort of clouded in the racist lens of the day, mm-hmm. too. Willie Muse himself said that he was, he used the word stolen. He was stolen. He named the person who stole him. And that's the story that the family still sticks by. And what was that story? How did that happen? They were working in the tobacco fields? The, there were people out there. They were they called them freak hunters. And, and the, the sideshow was a huge deal. The circus was the largest form of entertainment mm-hmm. from 1840 to 1940. And the sideshow was a big part of that. I mean, it's just the whole thing's kind of hard to get your head around a time when people would actually pay money to for a little extra quarter to go into the sideshow and see the half lady, the giant, the fat lady, the Dwarf family, et cetera, et cetera, and these two albino brothers. That was what people did. That's why they were such an attraction. Albinism was, um, they were considered a pretty good find. How rare is it to have two albinos in one family? She actually had three out of her five children were albinos. It's pretty rare. Albinism is more common among African-American families than people of European ancestry. And what were the conditions like in the circus, in the sideshow, after they were stolen? So in the early days, um, it was pretty rough, according to the stories that Willie told his family. World War I was just going on, and they would sort of cry themselves to sleep at night, singing the song, It's a Long Way to Tipperary, which is an anthem about missing home. They were told that their mother was dead and that they should stop crying. Once they saw their mother in 1927 and were able to go home. And once they rejoined the circus, this time for pay the following year, they always reported that they liked it better. And it was really, I mean, you have to think about the Stockholm syndrome. It was really the only life they knew. They were never able to go to school, so they never could read or write. Hmm. You see the pictures of them there. They they were exhibits. They were also musicians. Um, they were dressed with some care because you don't want to, they were taken care of um, to some extent because you, cause you wouldn't exhibit somebody um, that looked like they had been harmed or something. So I don't think they were treated terribly after 1928. I think before that it was pretty rough because late into his life he said terrible things about the man who was their main manager and he was the one who would skim their wages. Were you ever able to interview Willie directly? I was not. No. As I, as I said, she... Um, She thought he had been exploited his whole life, and and he was resting. I mean, her first memory, if you can imagine. This is Nancy Saunders. This is Nancy, the niece. 
and the care, caretaker eventually. But as a little girl, her f- first memory is of, of Roanoke is black and white, banging on the family's door in the middle of the night, demanding to see the savages who eat raw meat. People had never seen dreadlocks before. Mm-hmm. Uh, early in the retirement, um, somebody saw them walking through Washington Park, and they called the police, and they said, there's two savages on the loose. Finally, they just stopped going out. Uh, the barber would come to their house. The doctor would come to their house. By the time they did retire, because of the legal work Harriet Muse had done that lasted for many decades, uh, they were able to retire home to a house that was bought and paid for, which would have been very unusual for an African-American family in the early 1960s. So given all the exploitation of the Muse brothers and the way that the family felt about it, was it hard for you to go in there as a, as a white journalist and to, you know, uh, persuade them and to feel comfortable telling this story? It took literally 25 years, right. maybe a little bit longer. I mean, and she still doesn't trust me all the way, but she called recently. She said, you just sauntered in and you thought I was just going to lay this story out for you. Um, and I said to myself, Scratch has met his match. I was Scratch. He was the match. Like, mm As I saw the way the press had treated them, I, I began to understand. You know, our newspaper didn't print black brides until the 1970s. The newspaper cheered editorially when two black neighborhoods were wiped out for urban renewal mm-hmm. in the name of progress. I brought along a few clippings just of how various media treated the family I would love to hear once some. they had the reunion. The New Yorker piece profiling them the next year uh, described it as, they did their as they walked. Their eyes didn't quite focus. They love monkeys and kangaroos. Well, their eyes didn't focus because of their albinism. They had this condition. What year was this? This was 1928. Mm -hmm. And and later in the piece, it said, they returned to the circus because, quote, the fried chicken had given out in Roanoke. Hmm. In 1928, season opener, a coverage in Madison Square Garden, the headline in the New York Times. So they were in the headline. It said Mm -hmm. the headline was, Eco and Ico are happy. And when you went down into the story, which was all kind of press fed back in the day Mm -hmm. by the press agent, it didn't mention the lawsuit or the servitude either, just that they were back and happy now that they finally, after 10 years, had the permission of their parents. Hmm. So... I was just trying to to build the context. In what world would that be okay not to ever get the family's point of view? Why did you want to tell the story? At the end of the book, there's a young uh, great, great, great niece of them who's now in college, and she talks about the Baltimore riots and having to explain to her her mostly white uh, fellow students that, you know, who were saying, why are they looting? Why are they looting? You know, this didn't happen in a vacuum, that this is history. Some of this happened to my family. And until we understand each other's stories and how can we expect to have empathy and to really go beyond kind of where we are as a country. So in that way, you know, I hope this is a story that's that's very relevant today. Has Nancy Saunders read it? Yes, she read it. Um, She read it for fact checking after it had been edited. She's never said she liked it. <laughs> She's what not that she kind said. Of <laughs> well, the other day we had a book lunch party Sunday night, and the sit down and shut up is just kind of a joke between us now. But it's actually like it's kind of an important icon to me. To me, so I asked her about a year ago. I said, "Do you still have that sign?" Because the restaurant's closed, and she said, "I don't know. I'll look for it." When she never got back to me. So the other night at the book party, there had been an article in the Roanoke Times about the book coming out, and it mentioned the sit down and shut up. And the guy who gave her the sign, the customer, brought the stent. And she saw it. And I said, Nancy, did you ever find that sign? She said, yeah, I got that sign. And I said, well, so what do you think? You think maybe you could will me that sign? And she said, you can have the sign after you deliver my eulogy. So she didn't ask me to deliver her eulogy. Wow. (laughs) She said I could have the sign after I did it. So I was very touched. It was her way of saying, hey, you're not so bad after all, Scratch. That's a great story. Um, Thanks. I've got a great picture of it, too. (laughs) What a great moment. All right. The book, again, is True Vine, Two Brothers, A Kidnapping and a Mother's Quest, A True Story of the Jim Crow South by Beth Macy, who is also the author of Factory Man. That book is being turned into a movie. Yeah, it's in development. So fingers crossed. Congratulations again on the book. Thanks so much, Pamela. Alexandra Alter joins us now to talk about what's going on in the literary world. Hi, Alexandra. Hi, Pamela. So it sounds like Stephen King has a new book. 
Stephen King has a new book, although it's published under a pen name, Beryl Evans, and it's not for his usual audience. This is a picture book. I believe it's his first picture book called Charlie the Choo Choo. And Beryl Evans, um, hardcore Stephen King fans will recognize that name. It's a character from his Dark Tower series, which has sold over 30 million copies. So a lot of people will recognize that. And then he put a little hint, a little clue for people who might not know the name Beryl Evans. He blurbed this picture book. It says, if I were ever to write a children's book, it would be just like this, Stephen King. It's um, not often that you can blurb your own book. I know. More authors should be given the opportunity to do that, I think. <laughs> so it's funny. I was reading a little bit about the plot of this picture book. I, I don't have a copy yet. It comes out in November. It sounds a little bit like his horror novel, Christine. It's about a, a choo-choo train um, that, uh, that its name is Charlie, and the train engine is actually alive. So the engineer of the train, Bob, has a secret, and it's that his train is, is a fully conscious alive train much like the animated car Christine that killed people but we'll see I, I suspect this won't be as bloody but it's interesting to see him going into this space a lot of adult novelists have been writing picture books lately we had Jane Smiley's picture book earlier this year that was her first Sherman Alexie also wrote his first picture book Calvin Trillin Edwidge Danticat all these authors are kind of writing things for younger readers younger and younger readers it's for the prestige exactly it's for the, it's for the prestige. And, you know, this it's an interesting shift. You've seen authors going into YA and middle grade and to have them go to readers who maybe can't even read on their own yet. Okay, so Charlie the Choo Choo by Beryl Evans, a.k.a. Stephen King, illustrated by Ned Dameron. When can little readers and big readers get this book? It's coming out on November 22nd from Simon & Schuster Books for Young Readers. So a Thanksgiving title, not Halloween. Very interesting. Although I noticed in the illustration that the train is smiling in a sort of sinister way. So I'm curious to see how scary this book is. All right. Dark tales for your four-year-old. Thanks, Alexandra. Thanks for having me. Here's an excellent title for a book. No Fair, No Fair, and Other Jolly Poems of Childhood. Author Calvin Trillin and illustrator Roz Chast are here to talk with our children's book editor, Maria Russo, about their new picture book. Could you tell us how this idea came about? Usually uh, picture books that have an illustrator and an author who are separate people um, don't work together. And it starts with the writer, the author. Was that the case here? Did this start with your uh, poems, Yeah, sort of. Um, I think it all started when... My uh, grandson, who was then about six, was slow in getting dressed. And uh, his mother, my daughter, said, uh, put on your pants, Nady. And I found myself singing, oh, this is such a silly rule that people must wear pants to school. (laughs) A better rule, a wise man said, is wear your underpants instead. That eventually became one of the poems of the book. I don't know where it came from. It came from uh, deep in the collective unconscious. <laughs> yeah. I <laughs> think that the tune, which I will not bother you with, was to the verse to Jimmy Crack Corn. Oh, great. Great. So there's a, there's a classical feeling to a lot of these poems. So, Ross, how did you get on board with this project? Calvin asked me if I would be interested in illustrating these poems, and when I read them, I knew that they would be really fun to illustrate. They're hilarious and Fun, and they were fun to illustrate. And you've done other children's books. Yes, yes. I've done a, a couple of books about one of my pet parrots, uh-huh. who is, alas, no longer with us. But uh, <laughs> I used to make up a lot of songs about him, and our, my kids and I, we used to talk about him all the time as if he were a little person. And, you know, we would say to each other, picture Marco in a graduation gown and a little cap and in the in his wingtip, he's holding a little diploma. Do you find it's different to do illustrations for children's books uh, as opposed to for your grown-up stuff? Yes and no. Well, the, my grown-up stuff, I wrote it. So, you know, there, that is different because then I'm writing and drawing and it's going along and this is illustrating somebody else's words. So, But in some ways, the process is similar. Do you do you think about a child looking at these drawings and having a different reaction, say, than an adult? No, actually not. I'm usually reading it and then 
I get a sort of image in my head of what I want to draw, and I'm not really thinking about whether it's an adult or a child looking at it. I'm, I'm picturing, you know, I think about the poem that you wrote about sharing the back seat. When there's a, an invisible, the two kids, the boy and the girl, are sitting in the back seat of a car, and there's this invisible line. Of and, course. And, you know, God forbid one kid should shift over, you know, to the other <laughs> side. And I saw that with my kids all the time. So I was just sort of picturing that thing of, like, when one kid sort of sneaks to the line, and it's like they're sitting there. It's like, I'm not touching it. I'm not touching it. It's like, <laughs> look, 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 look. Over the line. Over the line. Yeah, that's, that's one of those classic times. I used to refer to as my sister's. My sister, who we called, I called Suki the Oppressor, uh, who's slightly older, uh, had an expansionist backseat policy. Was, <laughs> Just inching over bit right. by bit. Yeah. And then we had a terrible moment when my father said something very damaging to my cause. Uh, and it sounds a little retrograde now, but he was a traditional person. He said, we do not hit girls. Uh, you will never hit your sister again. And Suki was not visited with a similar injunction. So oh. I became basically disarmed. Oh, that's terrible. Unilaterally. That's terrible. Well, there is so much unfairness in childhood there and is. throughout this book. What are what are some of the others um, in here that, that came from your, your childhood experience? Well, the grandpa rule, of for course. instance, which comes from my recent childhood experience now that I'm a grandpa, which is basically there are no rules except the grandpa rule, which is you can do whatever you want to. Uh, <laughs> these scenarios in these poems are so universal. The great thing is that they can be enjoyed by children, parents, and grandparents. Um, so so many of these. What, what were some of the ones that especially spoke to you, Roz? I really did like that backseat one. And I think, well, I was an only child, so it wasn't really so much of my childhood because I could have the whole backseat. Yeah. Uh, but I thought about my own kids and the car trips that we took when there was always fighting in the back seat to the point where if we took a long car trip we would pile up stuff in between the kids and i remember once we had this pile of stuff and then on top of it was one of those you know picnic hamper things and it was like picnic hamper kid picnic hamper other kid and i hear this conversation wafting to the front seat of my son saying to my daughter, she, he was the older one, and they're like about 10 and 7, and he goes, you want to play Hitties? And hitties? Hitties. <laughs> and she goes, what's Hitties? And he goes, put your hand over here on top of the thing, and then bam, you know, he hits. <laughs> you know, I knew this was going to happen. I don't know why I didn't, like, turn around and say, like, if you play Hitties, you guys, you know, etc., hmm. you're going to walk home, you know, whatever. But This is why uh, God invented minivans. I, I <laughs> compared it to the... Uh, geopolitical tension and the border between the old Soviet Union and Finland. <laughs> in, in the backseat of... Yeah, of I played talk. Finland. <laughs> <laughs> Most of these, uh, the poems grew out of some sort of experience, uh, sometimes years old. I, I somehow stuck in my mind that one of my nephews, when he was taken to get a shot that he was fearing, said to his mother as they pulled in the car, uh, maybe you could take the shot for me. I'll just wait in the car. That's so funny. Uh, That's and so great. That that end up to the poem. Yeah, can Jenny the, take this shot yeah. for me? I've done so much for her. And let's not forget all the unfairness at school. Uh, some of oh. my favorites yeah. here are school, of school related. Unfairness. And there's a poem in there. I actually, when I meet a kid and we're trying to sort of break the ice, ask the question. Who is the nastiest, meanest, awfulest kid in your class? Such a great question. And, yes. And you'd yes. be surprised how often the answer is Jason. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't know what that means, but I think people who are about to name babies ought to think about it a little bit. Yeah, the universal uh, Jason. So I, I, so that one is a way, in a way, is about me, um, because some of the kids, some of the kids say. Oh, I don't, we don't have a really nasty kid, and some of the kids named Jason, and one angelic little girl I met in St. Louis, I think it was, smiled and said, "I am." <laughs> wow, that's great. Wow. Well, that is one of the great things about these poems is that they kind of offer grown-ups a way to talk to children because yeah. children really love to talk about all the yes. stuff in in, in here. Right. Who that's a great intro to yeah. for anyone looking for a way to talk to a kid you don't know. Who's the 
awfulest kid in your class, you know. The pet one was really good, too, um, about, get, you know, the kids who wanted to get a dog. And I remember growing up in an apartment and really, really wanting a pet. And I did have a goldfish, and that is not a pet. Nah. That's a, it's not a pet that you can pet, as they said. Yeah, it is not nah. a pet you can pet. Well, I didn't we, even feel sad when he died. That's how less, little of a pet <laughs> he we was. We had the same discussion in our house for a long time. And at one point, my older daughter said, when somebody said, why don't you get cats? And my older daughter said, Daddy hates cats. And I said, Daddy does not hate cats. That would be prejudice. <laughs> and you were brought up to abhor prejudice. Daddy has never met a cat that he liked. Which was your favorite to draw, Roz? I like drawing the eating habits one with a plate of, like, yucky food. Cause, oh, yeah. you know, oh. kids That's a great one. often have, and, you know, I mean, so do I. Like, there are certain things that's like, uh-uh. And yeah, it was just, so odd to have a kid who ate everything. Have you two worked together at The New Yorker? Both of your names are so associated with the magazine. No, we, we uh, uh, actually, we didn't know each other very well. I mean, we had met a couple times at uh, New Yorker functions, but that was about the connection. So this book brought you two together? It really did. Yeah. And, I mean, also it was, um, I mean, I had been an admirer of Roz's work for... Feeling uh, is very mutual. Oh, thank you, Roz. Well, it really is a sensibility <laughs> match with this book. Thank you. Thank you. And the book, again, is called No Fair, No Fair, with exclamation points, and other jolly poems of childhood. The poems are by Calvin Trillin, and the pictures are by Roz Chast. Uh, on the fourth of the month, uh, I met Jack at a music festival. Right. And uh, and we got on very well and uh, sort of had um, relations. <laughs> and uh, the next week, uh, that is to say on the 11th of the month at Jude's baby christening, to be exact, uh, following the consumption of quite a lot of alcohol, um, Mark and I, where we had um, similar relations. <laughs> And, uh, and this is the funny part, <laughs> I suppose. Owing to these relations, uh, the resulting life form currently residing in my tummy could actually, in fact, be either of yours. You may have heard about the new movie, Bridget Jones's Baby. But you may not know that the novel of the same name by Helen Fielding is also out now. It's her fourth book about Bridget Jones, who we first met almost 20 years ago as a hapless, chronically unmarried young woman. Molly Young, our reviewer, is here to talk about the latest in Bridget Jones's world. Hi, Molly. Thank you. Hi. So um, this is Helen Fielding's fourth Bridget Jones book. Tell us what happens in this book, not giving away, I guess, the, the ending for those who haven't seen the movie or read the book. So a little context. First of all, the, the first Bridget Jones diary came out in 1995, and Bridget was uh, 30-something in that book. Then there was a subsequent book that she was a slightly older 30-something. Then the third book skipped forward in time till she was in her early 50s. And this book goes back in time. It kind of learned from its mistakes. And we find Bridget and she's in her late, she's a late 30-something. It's interesting to think of that timeline because it makes you feel like Bridget Jones was the sort of British equivalent to the America's sex in the city in certain ways. That's a good point. She was a very accurate British corollary in that the things that distinguish her from uh, Carrie and Sex and the City feel quintessentially British. Uh, and what I mean by that is what made Bridget Jones charming when she first um, emerged was the fact that she was incredibly self-aware, but also very, very undisciplined, which is something that I think most people can identify with in some form. But putting this character, Helen Fielding, the author, took this character and had her write her story in the form of diary entries, which are sort of a self-dramatizing medium. And so that had the effect of taking the sort of battle between the Bridget Jones that the character was and the Bridget Jones that she wanted to be and sort of turning it into a full-scale war, mm -hmm. which was funny and charming and successful. I think the first book was really a great book. It's hard to write uh, prose that feels effortless on the page, and Helen Fielding is really good at that. Another thing that um, Sex and the City and Bridget Jones have in common is that they were both started as newspaper columns. They were. And actually, Candace Bushnell, who wrote the Sex and the City columns for the New York Observer in the 90s, she actually had kind of a British tone to her writing, now that I think about it. It was sort of kind of uh, cynical and funny and sophisticated and 
brash. I mean, Candace Bushnell, I think, is a great writer, um, just as good as Helen Fielding, if not maybe a little bit more interesting. But yeah, the Bridget Jones's column started as in, in The Guardian, was it? In The Independent. The Independent. You know what we need is we need a British term that's like that je ne sais quoi, but for British. Yeah. You know, something more elegant than Britishness. All right. So she's made her way now through three previous books. Yes. What's the kind of, again, and I will confess, I have not read any of them, but luckily you have read all of them. What's the kind of snapshot of each of these books and, and what happens leading up to this one? They're inspired, the first one and I guess the subsequent ones are also inspired by Jane Austen's Pride and Prejudice. And Bridget finds herself alternately pining after and being revulsed by Mark Darcy, who's played by Colin Firth in the movies. And obviously Bridget Jones is played by Renee Zellweger. I can't read these books without uh, picturing both of those actors in character. The diaries chronicle her courtship with Mark Darcy. Then the third book... um, the one that came out before this current one, we find out sort of in an unexpected footnote that Mark Darcy has died in Sudan. He's a journalist of some kind or foreign correspondent. That might be one of the reasons that this fourth book goes back in time again. And and so we're back with Mark. who's He's alive again. He's alive. And as buttoned up as always. So where does it fall in the chronology? Chronologically, this would be the third book, but it's actually the fourth book, if that makes sense. Um, And so Bridget gets pregnant in this book, as the title suggests. And the mystery is, uh, who is the father? And who are the candidates? The candidates are, number one is Mark Darcy. And number two is Daniel Cleaver, who is Mark Darcy's best friend and the man whom Bridget cheated on Mark Darcy with in a supply closet on uh, the eve of their engagement, which uh, forestalled the marriage. And that was in a previous book. Yes. Okay. Um, Giving us a a very good timeline. The one other thing that's interesting about timeline is that unlike the other books, I think, uh, the movie version of this came out before the book. Before the book or very closely... Was on its heels. I, it, it was. It's in any case. It wasn't the, the. Here's the book, and now we'll wait for the movie to be made. It felt very simultaneous, and I don't. I can't imagine what the timeline was of Helen Fielding writing the book. I mean, obviously she wrote the book before the movie because it's not an adaptation of the movie. But there is something very strange about usually a book will come out and allow an audience to sort of accrue, and then the movie will come out after the audience has sort of had some time to metabolize the book and is hungry for more. This was just like a, a Thanksgiving feast of Bridget Jones. I guess the other way uh, to think about it is that there was a long period between this and the previous installment. So perhaps the thought was that the appetite was already there and, and might wane if not seated. And that's probably right. And there is something that feels there is something that feels very belated about this book. Mm-hmm. Reading it, I kept uh, finding it so strange that this character is presented as this ball of effervescent charm when actually she just seems completely dysfunctional and, and you know, amusing. But mm-hmm. I, I definitely wouldn't say that she comes off as charming. And I think so she sort of is a throwback to heroines like Holly Golightly, who were sort of flighty and tripping about the world and rescuable and adorable. And it made me realize that the heroines that I think we tend to gravitate towards now are more in the ultra competent frame. So more girl with the dragon tattoo than Holly Golightly. So do you think that sort of time has passed Bridget Jones by? I think, uh, yeah. (laughs) (laughs) Um, Does it feel like a, a sort of fully fleshed out novel in and of itself? In some ways, it feels like maybe I would say a third draft when maybe there needed to be a fourth draft. One thing that comes to mind is I actually couldn't squeeze this into the review, but there's a very odd framing device in the book, which is that it is it is in the form of diary entries. But at the beginning of the book, there's a, a letter to Bridget Jones's son, who's the baby of the title, and mm-hmm. sort of a, along the lines of, darling boy, you know, here's my diary entries. This is the story of how you came to be. And then at the end of the book, there's another note that says something like, darling boy, that was the story of how you came to be. And it feels sort of like the kind of scaffolding that a writer might erect to sort of ease into the writing and then on a second or third draft go back and kind of take it out because mm-hmm. it doesn't feel necessary. I think there are readers who who choose to read this book, I think they'll find that either they completely forget about the framing device mm-hmm. or they'll remember it. And, you know, every 40 or 50 pages, there's, you know, some very detailed description of a sex scene or, or something, you know, you know, I'm far from a prude, but, you know, Bridget, you know, getting bleeped in the bleep and, I just imagine readers cringing every 40 or 50 pages and 
and just getting a case of the willies when they remember that this is supposed to be a, a letter to the the baby in utero. Right. Odd, <laughs> there is that. <laughs> is Bridget Jones a character who readers love and embrace because they like to see her grow and change or because she's always Bridget in the end? I think that's one of the problems with this book is that, you know, she we love this character originally because she was a glorious mess. And if an author is going to continue a character's lifespan beyond, you know, one, two, three, four books, that character has to change. And so if you strip away the sort of um, delightful incompetence and, and sort of accident proneness of Bridget, where does that leave her? And where it leaves her is she's sort of the same person with slightly more self-awareness, slightly more critical of her mistakes, um, but forging ahead in life nonetheless. But she's thinner. She is thinner, and that is not addressed. It's just mysteriously thinner. The, the struggle with weight has completely disappeared. Well, the cynical, I didn't see the movie, but the cynical part of me wonders if that's because Renee Zellweger didn't want to put on the weight for the movie, so they just made her magically thin. I think you're not the only cynic in the room. Really? All right. <laughs> Molly, thank you so much. Thank you, Pamela. My colleagues John Williams and Greg Coles join us now to talk about what they are reading, what we're reading, and what everyone else is reading. Hi, guys. Hey. Hi, Pamela. So let's start with the other people. Greg, anything new on the bestseller list of note? These are the bestseller lists that will appear in our Halloween issue, the October 30th issue. And so maybe fittingly, the the most notable books are all by dead people. I see dead people uh, (laughs) this week on the list. Um, Including on the hardcover fiction list um, at number three, Vince Flynn, who died in 2013 of prostate cancer. He was only uh, 47 years old and um, had a very popular series of thrillers starring a guy named Mitch Rapp. He is back um, for the second time with a, a book published by somebody, written by somebody else. Kyle Mills uh, has taken up the Vince Flynn, Mitch Rapp series. This book is called Order to Kill. Vince Flynn, colon, Order to Kill. That's new at number three. That's in the Tom Clancy model of uh, including the old author's name yeah, in the title. You know, some, some franchises are just too valuable for the publishers to give up. After James Patterson dies uh, at some point, we'll see new Alex Cross books by uh, somebody who's not James Patterson. There are dead people on the nonfiction side of things, too. Um, William F. Buckley Jr., who died in 2008, um, has a collection called A Torch Kept Lit, new at number 16. This is a collection of his eulogies um, for Mm. people that he admired um, throughout his life, um, significant 20th century figures. It's um, compiled by James Rosen, who's a contributor to Fox News and was uh, really a Buckley protege, somebody who published in National Review. um, And he recognized that Buckley had a real talent for delivering the eulogy, and he's he's pulled them together into this book. Um, And Arnold Palmer, also who just died in September, uh, has a book new at number 11 called A Life Well Played. It's sort of a, a memoir in essays and and um, looking back at his career and his relationships. Anyone alive and well on that list that's new? <laughs> uh, yeah, sure. Mary Oliver, the poet, um, has an essay collection called Upstream that's new at number 10. And then there are the, the usual celebrities. Brian Cranston has a memoir called A Life in Parts that's new at number 9. Speak of the Devil, James Patterson uh, is on the nonfiction list, surprisingly, with a book called Filthy Rich, uh, written with John Connolly and Tim Malloy. Um, That's new at number three. It is a look at Jeffrey Epstein, the billionaire uh, who was convicted of sex with underage girls. And that's what you're reading, John, right? I am not reading that. I read over the weekend, actually, a really beautiful and heartbreaking, fairly short book uh, called Back by Henry Green. Green is an English novelist who I wrote about in my column for the book review last week. And um, he kind of comes in and out of fashion among serious readers every 10 years or so. And the New York Review Books Classics line uh, is putting out eight of his books over the next few seasons, starting with three um, this fall, including this one. And When I asked Edwin Frank, who's the publisher of NYRB, um, for his favorite green book, he named this one um, back, which I had never heard of. I'd read a couple of his novels and his memoir a few years ago. Um, This is the story of a guy who returns from World War II having lost his leg uh, in battle. And soon after he was taken as a prisoner of war, the woman he loved back home had died. And so he comes back home and he meets a woman who resembles the woman he lost uh, to the degree where he starts to sort of believe that she's her and that she's lying when she says she isn't. And um, 
the way that their relationship develops and that he eventually kind of accepts who she is and, and what they mean to each other. Um, Green is a is kind of a, a somewhat icy and and off kilter writer his style is hard to describe um and the book begins that way and then i would swear that as it goes along it almost becomes more plain spoken and as their relationship develops which just has this really powerful cumulative effect and i just found the last few pages especially just incredibly moving and Greg? I'm reading an essay collection called The Ghosts of Birds by Elliot Weinberger. Weinberger is uh, one of these people um Anthony Lane is another, Rebecca Solnit another, who when I see their byline, I'm pretty much guaranteed to um, read what they have to say. Weinberger writes a lot for the New York Review of Books, also for the London Review of Books. Um, and he, he's pretty wide ranging. A few years back when George W. Bush um, published uh, Decision Points, his uh, memoir of his time in office, um, Weinberger wrote uh, a very famous essay for the New York Review of Books, um, viewing that memoir through a postmodern lens, kind of taking Michel Foucault and applying those rules to, <laughs> to the book itself. It's quite brilliant. It, it's included uh, in this collection, The Ghosts of Birds. He's just a very reflective and fluid and entertaining uh, writer. The book opens with a consideration of what might have happened to Adam and Eve after they were expelled from the Garden of Eden. Um, And that essay opens with a really great anecdote, uh, probably apocryphal, but it's about um, Champlain, uh, Samuel Champlain, uh, who was sitting after an Algonquin uh, victory in the, you know, early 17th century uh, with the the chief of the Algonquins, Grand Sagamore. And they started talking about theology. And Grand Sagamore uh, said, well, I think there's only one God. And after God created everything, he put some arrows in the ground. And those arrows turned into the men and women that populated the earth. And Champlain said, no, no, that's just totally pagan superstition. That's false. There is only one God. But what happened is he took a lump of clay and made a man (laughs) and then took a a rib from that man and made a woman. And Grant Sagamore said, huh, okay. uh, um, Weinberger's line about that. The Grand Sagamore looked doubtful, but following the rules of hospitality remained silent. (laughs) And and then he uses this as the premise to go into uh, the story of Adam and Eve and and what happened um, in the garden and after. Pamela, what are you reading these days? Well, I am back to Hamilton, and I will uh, make slow readers everywhere uh, feel more comfortable by saying I will probably talk about it for the next 10 to 20 weeks um, (laughs) as I slowly make my way through it. Um, But what's interesting me um, this week about it, and again, I'm still early on, about a third of the way through, is just the genius, the genius of Lynn manuel Miranda. (laughs) Um, It's, you know, it can't be overstated. Um, The way in which he took this book and translated it uh, into a musical is just astounding. And there are little hints of it um, throughout. Uh, You know, there are places, obviously, where he condenses, where he takes liberties with the chronology and things that you would have to do in adapting a serious uh, long uh, biography (laughs) uh, into a hip-hop musical. Um, (laughs) But then there are these little parts where you see, okay, like that are so illuminating, these moments. So um, listeners will remember uh, this song, Yorktown, uh, The World Turned Upside Down. We'll play just a, a bit of that to remind them. Monsieur Hamilton. Monsieur Lafayette. In command where you belong. Are you saying no sweat? We're finally on the field. We've had quite a run. Immigrants. We get the job done. So what happens if we win? I go back to France. I bring freedom to my people if I'm given the chance. We'll be with you when you do. Go lead your man. I see you on the other side. Till we meet again. I am not following my shot. I am not So... Reading Ron Chernow's chapter on Yorktown, um, I came across uh, this passage um, at the end of the Battle of Yorktown. Chernow writes, Tens of thousands of onlookers gaped in amazement as the shattered British troops marched out of Yorktown and, to the tune of an old English ballad, the world turned upside down, moved between parallel rows of handsomely outfitted French soldiers and battered, ragged American troops. Hmm. So you see exactly where that came from. Another uh, little tidbit that I was um, reading last night, um, this is a view that you don't quite get as much in the in the musical Hamilton, um, mm. but this is talking about um, Hamilton as a father. Turnow writes, Hamilton's dark view of human nature never dampened his home life, but only enhanced it. His eight children never appear to utter a single unkind word about their father. 
Admittedly, an early death made such carping distasteful, but complaints don't even surface in private letters. The second he got home, he shed his office cares and entered into his children's imaginative world. Son James said, quote, His gentle nature rendered his house a most joyous one to his children and friends. He accompanied his daughter Angelica when she played and sang at the piano. His intercourse with his children was always affectionate and confiding, which excited in them a corresponding confidence and devotion. That's kind of sweet. That's lovely. Yeah, I was talking to a friend um, at Vogue uh, yesterday, another editor, who uh, they did a very early st- story on uh, on Hamilton, the musical. And uh, she told me this uh, anecdote that Lin-Manuel had, has told, but I had forgotten that he was reading... Ron Chernow's biography on the beach, and he just was thinking, "Oh my God, this is, is a, this has to be a musical." And then he was like, "But somebody's already thought of it. I'm sure it's already being done," <laughs> which I love. He was but, famously the first. <laughs> no, Lin Manuel, no one else is having that genius idea. But we're glad that you did. All right, John, Greg, thanks. Thanks, Pamela. Thanks, Pamela. Remember, there's more at nytimes.com/books. Our producer is Jocelyn Gonzalez, and you can always write to us at books at nytimes.com. Thanks for listening. For The New York Times, I'm Pamela Paul.